Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture on adaptive radiation in reptiles. So, um, this video, I mean the PPT and the notes have been given in two different segments for this uh, particular topic. But for the purpose of making video to in order to discuss and to have a continuation, I have clubbed both part 1 and part 2 into one single video. So, the PPT also has been merged into one. You can refer to the PPT and the notes and the video you can apply for both the parts in the, the same video holds good for both part 1 and part 2. And uh, before uh, going to this video, what the only the key points and the definitions and the important points I have put on the slide. But I will be explaining it in detail. So, what I am telling the content if you do not see it on the slide, do not get uh, confused. I am again telling the keywords and the important points has been written on the slide. But I will be explaining it to you in little more detail. So, let us learn about uh, adaptive radiation in reptiles. I am Dr. Lata. Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, Maharani Science College for Women, Bengaluru. Let us understand what is adaptive radiations and why it is so significant with respect to reptiles. Now, when we talk about reptiles, the evolution of reptiles bears a very special significance. They represent the first terrestrial vertebrates adapted for life in dry places on land. The dryness of the skin to prevent loss of moisture from the body, the method of reproduction including amniotic eggs capable of which made this development on land possible and the devices for economizing in the use of water. They are some of the achievements that these reptiles got adapted to and hence they become more successful in their terrestrial adaptations. Now, if uh, when we look at this generalized condition of these reptiles, the oldest fossils uh, that we come across is a, a group called as stem reptiles or cotylosauria. They range from the upper carboniferous to the upper triassic when uh, they became extinct. They closely resembled this lab labyrinthodont amphibia from which they had evolved. So, these primitive or generalized reptiles, they had thick body, small pointed head with dorsal nostrils, short tail and short muscular pentadectyle limbs. And the two characteristics were common, the complete roofing of the skull like this anapsid condition and the flattened plate like pelvic girdle. The size of these uh, reptiles range from 30 centimeters to 3 meters. So, you can imagine the wide variation in their size. From this generalized condition in the succeeding periods uh, arose several lines of radiation or specializations like these form the basic line and from these many um, uh, diversion of evolutionary branches occurred. Some leading to great array of reptiles both extinct as well as living and others to birds and mammals. Now, let us understand what does this term adaptive radiation is all about. Now, because of the competition for food and living space, a single ancestral species evolves into different forms which occupy different habitats. This process is called adaptive radiation or divergent evolution. Now, why had they have to divert? So that each one will be safe in their own niche so that they do not compete for um, you know food or space or you know to avoid from the predators they look for a very safe niche. Perhaps reptiles have shown the greatest evolutionary diversity and adaptive radiation of all vertebrate groups. Their adaptive radiation took place twice first in the Paleozoic and secondly in the Mesozoic era. Now, when we look at this Paleozoic radiation, during Paleozoic era, with no serious competitors on land, the ancestral reptiles or the so-called Cotylosaurus, they multiplied rapidly. 
occupying all ecological niches available to them so their adaptive radiation involved adaptation to different methods of locomotion and feeding um, so that uh, you find them in all different kinds of habitat because they were adapted to eat whatever they get and they got adapted to uh, different methods of locomotion and in this paleozoic uh, era the distinct anapsid and synapsid forms they dominated when it comes to mesozoic radiation by the end of this paleozoic the ancestral cotylosaurus had disappeared but their descendants produced a second and bigger radiation during mesozoic era they dominated not only the land but also the sea and the air throughout this mesozoic era hence it is called as age of reptiles they lasted over a pretty a good span of time at around uh, at about 130 million years this uh, extinct uh, mesozoic uh, reptiles are represented by as many as 16 orders of these one led to birds one order led to mammals and four to the modern reptiles so with the advent of cenozoic era the vast hordes of this mesozoic reptiles disappeared leaving behind the representatives of only four living orders now in our discussion we will not discuss about uh, uh, the one uh, which got extinct we will only focus on more, we will we will not discuss about all the extinct reptiles but only the more notable lines based on the morphology of the skull such as anapsidan synapsidan urapsida parapsida and diapsidans now when we look at this anapsid line the modern kilonia that is the turtles and the tortoises they represent a direct and an early offshoot of cotylosaurus retaining anapsid skull they have remained virtually unchanged since triassic some 160 million years ago whereas synapsid line the mammal like reptiles had a single temporal cavity in skull ventral to this post orbital and squamosal and early plecosaurus were similar to cotylosaurus later therapsida with differentiated dentition and improved locomotion were more mammal like so before disappearing in jurassic they gave rise to ancestral mammals that's how mammals got evolved from reptiles whereas from the urapsid line the urapsids uh, <coughs> sorry the urapsids or uh the plesiosaurus had a single temporal fossa in skull above the joint of post orbital and squamosal they were large marine turtle like heavy bodied and long necked creatures they were obviously flesh uh, fish eaters all became extinct towards the end of this cretaceous similarly the parapsid ones they were uh, more um, they were uh, another marine blind alley like urapsida represented by fish like or uh, ichthyosaurus they become extinct near the close of this mesozoic era whereas if you consider in the diapsid line most of the present day reptiles are diapsid with two temporal openings on either side of the skull separated by the squamosal and the post orbital bones the earliest diapsid divide into two branches lepidosauria and orcosauria uh, the lepidosauria were probably ancestral to modern squamata the snakes and lizards and rhynchocephalia the spinodont the orcosauria were the ruling reptiles dominating the mesozoic era they represented the extinct pterosauria the extinct dinosaurus and the modern crocodilia they also gave rise to modern birds pterosauria the extinct flying reptiles called pterosauria were of light build their forelimbs evolved into membranous wings or patagia the first three fingers were short 
hooked and probably used for clinging to rocks. Fourth finger was generally elongated to support the edge of the patagium, whereas the fifth finger was lost. So, it, uh, its huge horny and toothless beak was balanced by a backward bony projections of the head. Then coming to uh, Dinosaurus. Dinosaurus at the end of this Triassic, the pseudo Pseudosuchia, the early descendants of Orchosauria, gave rise to the most fantastic Mesozoic reptiles, the Dinosaurus, which means terrible lizards. They subdivided early into two orders, the Sauroschia and Orenthischia, depending on the structure of their pelvis. Now, Saurischia means reptile hips. Okay, Saurischia and Ornischia, depending on the structure of their pelvis. Here, Saurischia means uh, reptile hips. They possessed a tri radiate pelvis with pubis entirely separate and anterior to ischium. You can look at the diagram A here in which they are clearly shown how ischium and pubis are totally separate. And in this, the suborder uh, Theropoda included all flesh-eating and bipedal carnivores. Smaller Cretaceous ostrich-like forms such as um, Orinthomimus walked on three toes of large hind feet. Their forelimbs also had three fingers of which one was opposable like a thumb and used for grasping. Jurassic Allosaurus, a monster carnivore, was 10 meters long, but the largest and the most fearful predator that ever walked the face of earth was Tyrannosaurus rex. You must have seen all these in dinosaurus movies uh, wherein they project them to be very huge and have flying uh, dinosaurs ever. So these um, Tyrannosaurus rex, they were supposed to be the most fearful predator from Cretaceous of North America. It was 15 meters long and stood 6 meters high. Its head was disproportionately great with large jaws armed with dagger-like teeth. The teeth itself was 15 centimeters long. The three-toed massive hind legs were adapted for running, but extremely short forelimbs were almost useless. Whereas uh, the suborder, you know, whereas in the suborder sauropoda, that included huge herbivorous uh, quadrupedal dinosaurs means the ones which have four legs. Some of them were the largest and heaviest of all terrestrial and amphibious vertebrates that ever lived. Then Apatosaurus, Diplodo Diplodocus and Branchiosaurus were enormous Jurassic reptiles each more than 25 meters long and weighing over 50 tons. You can see the diagrams here in the slide and you can, you know, you can make out how huge they are. They probably lived in swamps where their body would be supported partly by the buoyancy of water. They had long necks and tails, small heads with exceptionally small brains and weak jaws. Whereas Orinthischia means orintho refers to bird. So orinthischia means bird hips. They had a typical tetraradiate bird-like pelvic girdle with pubis directed backwards parallel to ischium. You can observe in this diagram B that pubis lies parallel to this ischium. Okay, and it appears like a, a tetraradiate one. Ischium on one, pubic has one more process and you can see the difference between the Saurischia and the Ornithischia uh, pelvic girdle. They were all herbivores. 
like here in the diagram if you observe to this iguanodon and the um, stegosaurus you can understand the igliodon here towards your right hand bottom corner and stegosaurus here in this uh, slide so they both were uh, herbivores and the bipedal iguodon grew to 10 meters its sharp dagger like thumb observe for this iguanodon here uh, it's it has this it, it was almost up to 10 meters in length its sharp dagger like thumb was probably used for defense whereas the quadrupedal stegosaurus which was in the jurassic era measured 8 meters and weighed 10 tons Forelimbs were much shorter than hind limbs. Skull was small and brain much smaller than the lumbar swelling of the spinal cord. It had a parapet of heavy triangular plates on its neck. You can observe those pointed uh, plates on this stegosaurus. And uh, these, it, this, it had a parapet of heavy triangular plates on its neck, back and on the tail. The tail was also furnished with formidable, uh, formidable sharp spikes or spines. Then this tricerap triceratops, okay, which is a late Cretaceous, was 6 meters long and it stood 3 meters high. Its enormous head carried three huge horns projecting from a large bony frill or collar protecting the vulnerable skull. So you can clearly make out the difference between in its organization of the stegosaurus and triceratops. Here the head of this triceratops is so huge and it is so different with horns and frills whereas stegosaurus showed this triangular plates throughout the length of the body. So now the main question comes like when these dinosaurs were so well adapted with their uh, body spines and plates to fight against the predator, what caused their extinction? Now the main causes of extinction um, could be after thriving and dominating earth for 130 million years, the great dinosaurs and their contemporaries became suddenly extinct by the end of Cretaceous period. Various factors have been suggested for their total extinction such as catastrophism, epidemic, food poisoning, racial senescence, climatic changes, over specialization, interspecific warfare or competition with ancestral mammals. None of these has been accepted as being completely satisfactory. Probably the combination of these several factors could have led to their extinction. That's how reptiles being the most successful terrestrial um, organisms which was so well adapted with all different kind of adaptive measures and adaptive structures in their body being so huge and being so powerful even they had to uh, come to an end the era of reptiles had come to an end because the change in environmental conditions the probably the evolutionary forces uh, have given rise to much more sustainable species like birds and mammals and as a result this era of reptiles comes to an end. So this is how uh, the reptiles had exhibited a very high degree of adaptive radiations in order to survive themselves in the changing environments. So these are some of the uh, references from textbooks from which the content has been taken. Uh, I hope this concept of adaptive radiation in reptiles has been explained properly and I hope you all have understood. Thank you for listening.